Uh, I just want to thank you for thank you again for welcoming us. Um, I really appreciate it. This has been a great day. Um, like them, I have never been into a mosque before, so this was just a very interesting experience for me, and I really loved like hearing from you all and um, going on the tour. And this was just a really great day. So. I really, really um, liked how introspective prayer is. So, like, if you go to a Christian service, it's all about your focus is all on like the pastor, whoever's speaking, um, and like it's it's not as mystical or as spiritual as like being more inwardly focused and responding um, to the prayers and kind of like. Like, you're all together as a community, but each person as they're praying is very, like, with themselves and God. And I know that's what you said before, but, like, it's just very, it's very cool to see how, how, how different, like, prayer is and service is compared to, like, a lot of Christianity where, like, I think an emphasis on prayer is, like, reduced or it's not understood the same way. And I think this provides a lot of more deep access to something divine. Um, like, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Of course, of course. So the way that you saw us pray, mm -hmm. right? This yeah. is so unisome, brotherhood, sisterhood. It gives a sense of community, right? Yeah. We are as one human family praying to one God. So this is a consistent way that mosques all over the world, Muslims yeah. all over the world, we pray the same way. Compared to like, suppose if you go to like a one church in one corner, they pray in certain way. If you go to some other church, they may have a different way of service. Some other sect of Christianity, they may have a different set of service. But mm -hmm. we say that God is a God who wants to guide all of humanity. And He gave us guidance how to pray, when to pray, how to ask, how to ask for forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these is also an indication about the truth of Islam, that there is mm -hmm. God and He wants the best from us. Yeah. I also really appreciate like how constant it is. So if you do that prayer, I don't remember how many times a day you said, but that means that you are always continually focused on God every single day. Like you really can't go a huge portion of your day with like forgetting that that is your identity, that that should be your entire focus. And I think it's really easy in like in this culture, which is so like individualistic, it, it's so driven outwardly, we're seeking money, we're seeking, you know, all the things we have to do in college for our career, that you can really, you can very easily get very lost and not practice spirituality in any meaningful way outside of like a Sunday service, for example. But this is, is really grounds you to remind you that like your whole life is centered around God. So I really did think that that was very astounding. So so I think very similarly to Christianity, as I have been taught, although this might be a misconception, um, Islam is patriarchal. And that's like true of like Judaism as well and a lot of religious traditions. But you mentioned um, equality between men and women as being a basic tenet of Islam. Um, but at some point you made, a you made a distinction and you said spiritual equality. So can you like expand on what you meant by that? Because I'm really curious. Sure, sure. Because I mentioned spiritually right away, so people don't uh, mix equality with you know, equity. Yeah. Okay. See, in any system that we humans have to live in, there is always a hierarchy. Like in this mosque, there's a hierarchy. You have the imam, the resident scholar, you have the board of directors, then you have the common Muslims who come and pray. If you go in school and in a school and university, there's a hierarchy. You have the chancellor, you have the trustees, the board, right? The teachers, and then the students. Anywhere that you are, a society to function in a just way, there always has to be hierarchy and the roles have to be defined in the society. In the same way, a family system, which is the basic building block of any civilization, there is hierarchy. The father or the husband is the head of the household. So he's supposed to manage the financial need, the lodging, the clothing, right? And the protection of the family. The mother is equally responsible for the children and for the household. She has her own roles and responsibility and they complement with the husband. Just because they have different roles does not mean one is superior and one is inferior. Father is the, is the head of the household. He's supposed to consult with his wife, with the family members, 
when he makes the decision. Correct? Uh, so both roles are important. So if the mother is fulfilling her role, she will get equal reward when the husband is fulfilling his role. Correct? Thank but you. any other follow up on that? Uh, um, I don't think so. The only thing that... <laughs> any controversial I, I too? I have a question. Okay. Sure. Um, What's your name, brother? Brent. Brent? Okay. You know, can you make it better so all of us are covered? Yeah, so. Yes, I actually have a question. As far as afterlife, um, what do you believe? Like, we, you were talking about um, in your um, like question and answer. I'm <laughs> sorry. You were talking about in your question and answer how you believe that we're not born with sin, like unlike Christianity. So as far as the afterlife, what do you believe as kind of a, I don't have the words for it, but heaven or hell kind of thing? Right, right. So we say that this life is a short life, it's a temporary life, 80 years, 100 years, right, around that time. But the life in the hereafter is for eternity. So we say that this is a testing ground. This is like a classroom. God has given us the instructions and he wants to see who is going to follow it, who is going to disobey it. So every single human is going to die one day, just like people before us, they passed away. But that's not the end of our existence. God is going to bring everyone back to life. So we believe in a day of resurrection and a day of judgment. You know, just like in the schools, we have the evaluation by the teacher, right? At the end of the semester, we say the grand evaluation for every single human would be on the day of judgment. And God is going to judge us on two important things. What kind of beliefs that we had and what kind of deeds that we have done. Okay? Easy, right? So if a person has the right belief, worshipping only one God, not attaching any partners, not uh, worshipping uh, humans and animals and idols and the creation, only submitting and worshipping one God and then doing the deeds to the best of our ability and repenting to God each time that we fall short. So once we have the right belief and doing good deeds, God promises in chapter 2 verse number 25 of the Quran, he will guarantee those people eternal paradise. Alright? So we do believe in paradise. But we also believe in hellfire. You know, just like there's a failing grade in the classroom for the person who, I hope nobody gets it, right? For a person who does not uh, attend the classes, is absent and does not do the assignments, the quizzes, the final, and does not listen to the teacher, there is always, you know, a bad grade, a failing grade. In the same way, if a person associates partners with God means saying there is God but this person this human is God this idol this animal is God along with God or instead of God that is an unpardonable sin if the person dies like that yeah go ahead go ahead sorry so by that logic um, and this are all Christians condemned to hell because clearly that's a that's the basis of it is that idea right that 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 a human became God incarnate. I'm glad that you brought that up, all right? <laughs> because, you know, as a Muslim, I need to provide uh, the criteria for a person to go to paradise. I mean, not me providing, I'm just sharing what the Quran says, right? Yes. So let me just complete this answer, then I will come to that, right? So we say that, yes, so paradise would be a place in which God is going to bring us back to life in our body and in our soul on the day of judgment and the person will be placed in the body and the soul in paradise. So paradise is a place of reward. Means the wonderful bounties and the rewards of paradise is going to be forever. You'll have the reward for the body and reward for the soul, all right, in paradise. In the same way, hellfire is also going to be there forever. And we hope and pray that no one goes there, right? So now the question becomes, what about the Christians? are there committing that unpardonable sin that Islam tells us to avoid? Yeah. Generally, I would say yes. Because yeah. the Quran says in chapter number 5, verse number 72, 73, 74 and onwards, that do not say Trinity, do not say three. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not Allah or God and God is not Jesus. Anyone who keeps on saying and believing that, paradise would be forbidden for that person you know it is like this 
if you have a teacher in the class instead of obeying the teacher you're obeying somebody else mm -hmm. or you're obeying the teacher but somebody else is giving you instructions and you're equally obeying that diluting these instructions if you do that you may not be extracting the best education to graduate right so God loves us he wants us to go to paradise and he gave us guidelines see worshiping of Jesus and taking Jesus as divine Jesus never said that I am God or worship me you know when people ask Jesus about who to worship how to worship Jesus pointed towards God in Matthew chapter 6 verse number 9 Jesus, Jesus he showed that God should be the focus of worship you know even Jesus he worshiped God you know it says in Matthew chapter 26 verse number 39 people were coming after Jesus you know to get hold of him and to punish and to kill him he went to the garden of Gethsemane over there he prostrated himself on the ground and he prayed to God saying that oh God take this cup of death away from me not my will but your will so what happened in history right what's your name sorry I'm Nikki Nikki so what happened in history is when Jesus when he was performing miracles you know, raising people from the dead and healing the lepers, the blind and the sick people. Some people out of ignorance, they thought, you know what, maybe he's more than a human, maybe he's God, son of God and divine. And they started to raise Jesus from the status of a prophet to the status of God, son of God, divine and part of Trinity. So in fact, I was saying to one of, one of the lady that not until 325 in the Council of Nicaea that people equated Jesus with the Father or with God, right? Mm -hmm. 300, century, 300 years after Jesus was gone. Yeah. And in the year 381, in the Council of Constantinople, that's when they also added the Holy Spirit along with Jesus and with the Father. So the concept of Trinity, it was evolved three centuries after Jesus was gone. But what was the message of Jesus? You know, he said that, worship the one creator he said that uh, you are the only true god in chapter 17 verse number three of john he said that i of myself i cannot do anything john chapter 5 verse number 30 so when people when they moved away from the who jesus was and who god is god sent the last prophet and the last scripture to correct the people and to show them who god is and who jesus was also in the Hebrew scriptures, the idea that like the son of God was associated with like father-son relationships with uh, the Davidic kings. Yeah. So the idea of the son of God was associated with the, with the idea of being of the Davidic line. Um, the idea of that being associated with the divinity came from the Roman culture because they thought that the emperor... Um, was divine and that Augustus, his son, was therefore the son of God and would also participate in that divinity. So, like... You know the history very good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. In case you can't tell, she's a theology major. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, continue. Nikki. That's all I got. <laughs> so, again, you know this concept of son of God? You're also listening, right? The concept of son of God, this is a figure of speech. It should not be taken literally. Who's saying this? Not me. The Eastern Bible Dictionary, if you open it and if you look into the, the topic Son of God or Sons of God, it says a righteous person, a pious person used to be called a Son of God. It's a figure of speech. It's not to be taken as literally. You know, the Old Testament and the Jewish people, they used to call many people as Son of God. Right? You know that, Nikki, right? I'll give you one or two examples. In the book of Psalms, chapter number 2, verse number 7, David, right? Prophet David is called as the begotten son of God. Jacob is called as son of God, right? Peacemakers are called as children of God. In Luke chapter 3, verse number 38, Adam is called as son of God. Figure of speech, not to be taken as literally. So what happened was the Jewish people, they knew that it's a figure of speech. But when Christians, when they came on the scene, they diluted the concept of God and they gave the Son of God title to Jesus not as a figure of speech way but in a literal way. So the prophet, he, they evolved him to be as the Son of God from figure of speech to a literal Son of God. From there they gave uh, attributes of divinity to him and then they formulated Trinity three centuries after Jesus was gone. That's how the modern Christianity came on the scene. 
you know, if Jesus came back, comes back over here, he would be so shocked to find out, you know, what did you guys make of me? I did not, never preach that God is one in three, three in one or Trinity. He would say that I was never a Trinitarian. I was a monotheistic believer, submitter to one God. So the Quran that you guys have now came to correct our Christian brothers and sisters to save them, right? And to bring them back to monotheism, back to the submission of God. So all of us together, we want to go to paradise by by embracing the right faith, by following the right book and the right guidance and the right way of salvation. Go ahead, you have more follow-up? No, nope, nothing much. Thank you so much, though. But that was very insightful. Sense to guys, right? I'm trying yeah. to say as much as possible from comparative religion, from logic, from uh, history, right? As much as possible. So try to think about it because we only have one life to live. When we stand in front of God, it will be too late for us to come back and redo the things the right way, correct? God sent you to the mosque and today over here as a sign, God loves you. He wants you to get the right faith, the right concept of God, the right guidance. Uh, so at least he's giving all of us a chance. So I hope all of you with an open heart and mind as brothers and sisters, look into the Quran, pray to God, oh Allah, guide us, oh God, guide us. Inshallah, God willing, as we say, God will guide us. Amen, right? Brother, you were waiting patiently. I want to hear from you. Oh, yeah. But you guys, anything else from you? But you guys can listen to us. Yes, go ahead. Yes. I, uh, Christianity teaches that Jesus uh, died. God raised him up uh, from the dead. He went back to heaven. Islam does not teach that. Are you asking or are you saying? I'm asking. Okay, sure, sure. You guys, the question, right? So yes, according to Christianity, the way for salvation is to believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, correct? Yes. What Islam says, chapter number 4, verse number 157 to be exact, Quran says, I'm just giving the translation, Megan, all right? And you guys can read it up later. Quran says that they say and they boast, you know, the Jewish and the Roman people, that we killed Jesus, the son of Mary, the Messiah. They killed him not, neither they crucified him. It only made to appear to them. God lifted Jesus up to himself. Anyone who keeps on believing in the crucifixion of Jesus, Quran says that they are following nothing but conjecture. But the second important point is this. What's your name, brother? Brent. Brent, okay. But the second important point, uh, Nikki, is this, is that salvation in Islam does not depend on the birth or the death or the resurrection of any human, any prophet, any messenger, including Jesus. Salvation in Islam depends upon we repenting to God for forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, sincerely approaching Him without any mediator, and Allah promises in the Quran He can forgive the sins. But that makes, from the logical point of view, right, that also makes sense because personal accountability, what I do, what I bear, is followed by every single justice system in the entire, the whole world. In the history of humanity, if a person commits sin, the person should be punished or forgiven, not anyone else besides him, right? So we say God is a just God. God is fair. God is going to punish somebody for my sins or your sins and God's forgiveness is always there. God is one of the names or attributes of God Brent is that he is the most forgiving and the most merciful. Hmm. So that's the pathway of salvation in Islam, directly repenting to God, doing the best that we can do and having hope in God's mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Feel free to. We are having a... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, do you believe that Jesus, so we don't believe, or, or Islam does not teach that Jesus rose from the grave? Well, so, so, you did say that Islam doesn't teach that Jesus was crucified, so no, that was, that, they don't believe that. Yeah, so we don't believe that Jesus ever died. If Jesus never died, that means there is no point of Jesus' resurrection. So, if he On never, the third day or any day. So, if he never died, what, he just went straight to heaven? Yeah. Okay, so he never died. He never died. So there's no, never, never no resurrection. There's no resurrection. Gotcha. There is no three days in the hellfire, right? That itself is like, I'm an, I don't know why that's belief. However, what we believe, Brother Brent, is this. 
God is going to send Jesus back again in the second coming. All right. Uh, and then uh, Jesus is going to live as a Muslim the way that he was here in the first coming as a Muslim. A Muslim is a person who believes in God, worships God and follows the guidance of God. So as he comes back again in the second coming, he is going to fight and defeat the Antichrist. All right. Mm. Yeah. It's there in Islam. He is going to follow the Sharia, means the God's guidance, which is there in the Quran, brought, given by God to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The way that we pray, Jesus is going to pray that way, mm. right? He's going to pray to God the way that he did in the first, first coming. He's going to perform the pilgrimage because he's going to live as a Muslim. He will perform the pilgrimage. He will get married. He will have children and he will die a natural death. And then he would be buried in the in the city of Medina, next to the grave of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. That's not the end of the story yet, okay? Then every human is going to be uh, resurrected and Jesus is going to be resurrected again, just like you and me, every single person. And just like every single person would be standing in front of God, Jesus would be standing in front of God and God, going, God is going to ask Jesus. This, this is in the Quran, right? Chapter 5, verse number 116. God is going to ask Jesus, Did you say to your people that to worship you and your mother along with God or instead of God? Did you say that to your people that worship me? Jesus is going to say in front of God on the day of judgment, I never said that. I never said that. The only thing I mentioned to them is worship my God and your God, which is God, the one creator. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So that is kind of a more complete story of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, who we consider as one of the prophets in the chain of prophethood that started with Adam, ended with Muhammad, peace be upon him. Gotcha. Good Thank question. You. though. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Anything Parting remarks from you guys? Thank no? you. All right, Thank wonderful. You. I'm so glad that you spent here about four hours, precious hours of your life, but I hope this is worthwhile. Yes? Yes. Think about it. I, From the bottom of my heart, I will pray that may God guide all of us, may God bless all of us, and by God's mercy, we all go with God's mercy into eternal paradise. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Thank you.